Okay, so um, the next few problems you get, so now I'm going in reverse order in your book, which is really nice that I don't have to follow the order in your book. I gave you the point first because in my experience, showing people a bunch of limit problems where they don't know why we're trying to do it um, is irritating. So um, th that was the punchline. You're actually going to use the idea of limits to find the slope of curves. Um, that's, what, that's where we're going. So they're also going to talk about sequences, and sequences have limits. And this is usually how you see data in bio biology classes. We have um, a student in geology in here. I know that some of those examples are very similar. You sample data. But it's, it's a sampling of data. And I will always try to give you a real example and then the fake example. So you make the connection between the two. So why do you have this? Well, in general, when you measure something, you're sampling something. Right? You're, you're not, it's moving. Like the bacteria that they were talking about in their problem, that, that fake problem, it's not a, it's growing all the time, right? It's, not, it's continuously growing, I hope. But you're not measuring it all times unless you're a very, very uh, oppressed graduate student. You wouldn't be measuring it all the time. You would be measuring it make every minute or something, or maybe every day. We can ask Dr. Van Recline how often he makes his students go out and measure something. But human data, which I work with, is a lot like that because you need to either have a sensor on the human and you need to collect that data from the sensor. That's what we do. Or you can make the human come to the clinic and measure them. Well, then you get dropout, so that's not fun. Or you can go to their place and measure it. That's what I ended up doing when I ran a clinical study because I was too timid to ask people to come when they said they don't want to come. So I would go to their home. So I decided I'll never run a clinical study again. It's not for me. Any lab measure you get is like this. You're not measuring it all the time. You're measuring it at sample times. So um, I wanted to show you a real example. We, meaning that I ran the math. I didn't actually do the touching the humans. But we ran a randomized controlled trial. It's one of the fringe benefits of being in math. I don't actually have to do that part. But um, on 20 subjects that had obesity. And um, those 10 of those subjects that were in the study were guided by their weight loss using a mathematical model. That's where I came in. The mathematical model is programmed into a smartphone. We never saw them in the clinic. They were always outside of the clinic, and they were wearing all kinds of sensors and gadgets. So the sensors, um, they stepped on a, a, a scale called Body Trace. This is available. I don't know how expensive it is, but it's really cool. We use it all the time. There are um, scales that automatically wirelessly send up your weight. And we um, integrated my math model with their body weight so they could see where they stand in relation to where they're supposed to be. So it keeps them adherent. So it was a, a psychologist that uh, did the actual human side of the thing. And that's what the data of one person looks like. It look, it's a sequence. It's not a continuous curve. It's a bunch of sampled points. And they stepped on the body scale every day and their, wire, their data got wirelessly transferred to the clinic through their smartphones. So that's what sequence data looks like when it's real. Cool? I love, the, I love the sensors. If you're going into medicine, it's going to be a very different world. It already is. You're either buying into that idea that you can use sensor technology to see. You don't have to ask anybody anymore, did you have a good night's sleep? You strap a sensor on them and see. You don't have to wait till someone falls. You can put sensors on them. Right now, my father has dementia. And he was trying to get out of the bed and he can't walk. I bought a sensor and I put it right outside of his bed. So every time that he tries to get out of the bed, it starts beeping everywhere. My mom keeps tripping the sensor, so she's she's not she's old school, she didn't want to use it. But in our book, they use the symbol AN. AN means that in this example means the nth weight on the nth day, the nth weight or the nth day of their weight. So it has a meaning. A and stand, like A5 or A13 or A0 would be their beginning weight, 161 kilograms. That's not pounds. A1 would be 157.6 kilograms. A2 would be 155.8 kilograms. And would be the day. We had them step on the scale every day. So you see the day of weight loss, there's a point for every day of weight loss. Huh? A is the weight on the nth day. So A13, for example, would be 151. I just highlighted it off the list. It's 151. That's what they mean when they have this AN business, right? So those, that's a real example. Your book is full of fake examples, OK? The fake examples, they actually have an expression. 
I have never seen an expression working in medicine. I, I usually get data and have to figure something out with the data. But in your book, they have a lot of these, I call them fake examples. They're, they're, they're examples, right? They're not real. So they have like a formula there, n over 1 plus n. You would make the sampling of data by plugging in the values of n into that formula and make a table and then plot that data. Just like I had the weights, which was real data, this would be fake data that came from a formula. Make sense? That's the connection. So everything you do for the fake stuff, sometimes it's transferable to the real stuff. So can I ask about this grade? Like the last question, how do we take and then over That was in the form of a recursion. So I could say to myself, okay, what would happen if you kept everything the same, but you had an additional orange every day? Okay? What would happen to your weight? Everything else stays the same, but you kept adding on 100 more calories, maybe 50 more calories a day from that. That, well, based on your weight today, I could predict your weight tomorrow. That's called recursion, right? And I could also make a sequence like this. I would, every day, I would get a different weight based on what you're doing. In fact, that other study was that. They, he told them to cut back their calories a certain amount and then step on the scale. So you should see their weight going down. Sometimes. So it, it varies. Like one of, um, I can show you guys some of that stuff on a different day, so let's get through this stuff. That, that's the fun stuff. Yeah, it depends on what they ask me. So it's, a very different, it's very different than working on research problems or the problems you do on WebAssign. It's a problem that's interesting to them, and they have to ask me. And then I have to think about how, what I would do. So sometimes it's recursion. Sometimes it's not. <laughs> okay, so here's the WebAssign. I'm giving you all the answers. The purpose of this problem was just to teach you what a sequence is. Can we answer that now by using a real example? I think so. What's a sequence? It's an ordered list of numbers. Yeah? Just like the weights. It's obvious. What does it mean to say the limit as n goes to infinity? What does that mean? Well, that's a long-term behavior. What that means, it's the limit as, of what happens as n goes large. So. Let's go back to her orange example. <laughs> What's your name? I'm picking on you. Should I at least know your name? Myra. Myra. Myra eats an additional orange, keeps all her food the same. What's going to happen to her? What do you think is going to happen to her? Just an orange, but it's more than what she used to eat. What's going to happen to her weight? Probably should go up, right? If all her food is the same and she just adds on something more, it doesn't matter what it is, orange, cookie, but she's going to gain weight. Is she going to gain weight forever and just become like 10 years from now we see her and she's like, I ate, kept eating that orange every day and I, she's, she's like bulked out? Is that what we expect to see? What's going to happen eventually? You think? <laughs> yeah, eventually it's going to plateau, right? She eventually will plateau because her new body weight, her needs of her new body weight will be met by that you know, whatever she increased by. I said orange, but we do see this with uh, Thanksgiving data. You see an increase in weight, and some of that's maintained. So we call that weight maintenance. You also see this in chemistry class, thermal equilibrium. You take something cold and put it in a room that's warm. Take a piece of ice and put it on the floor of this room. What's going to happen to it? It's going to melt, and eventually it's going to have the same temperature as the room, right? Whatever the water is. So the temperatures start to become the same. That's called long-term behavior. That's one way we call it. In biology, we call it long-term behavior. We want to know what happens um, as you go out in years. When you do bariatric surgery, do I care if your weight goes down tomorrow or weight goes down three years from now? If you look at any bariatric surgery center site, they're going to tell you how, how long their patients have kept the weight off. They care long-term what happens. They don't care about one week after the surgery. So um, this is why it's important. It's the most important thing we ask, what happens long term. So here's a real example of a sequence. It's bariatric surgery data. This is interesting stuff. I'm at, this is what I'm working on now, so it's really interesting to me right now. Um, does anybody know what the uh, adjustable bands are, what that is here? Some of them? Uh, oh, no, uh, what, what this is, um, the adjustable bands, gastric bypass bands, or gastric bands, you know what that is? 
they, they ban part of your stomach and make a pouch with it. Okay, and this thing here is gastric bypass. They actually cut and then they take a portion of your stomach and bypass the large portion and they, they put it elsewhere in your digestive tract. So they bypass part of your stomach. So what you see is that the first sequence, these are sequences of points, and is measured in half years, right? And equals the first half year, you get this point. And a year, you get this point. And so forth. You get a bunch of points and you plot them, right? And so that's a sequence. So long term behavior is, uh, I can see it. It's flattening out the adjustable band. You get 15% weight loss. Looks like it's leveling off at 15% weight loss long term. The um, bypass, you see, it does seem to level off at 35% weight loss. But what is it doing? It looks like it's going up. Some studies have shown that they actually start to match each other after 10 years or so. So eventually they weight, gain weight, but not all the way back. They, they come back to the same point. Um, why, why not just use one over the other? The adjustable band has less risk, but there's more people who don't lose the weight from the adjust. Some people don't. See those bars? That's the variation. So there's a lot of variation here. And this is more aggressive of the surgery. But it comes with higher risk. So there's more mortality. So patients have to decide which is which one they're going to take. Maybe they need to lose the weight now, and their health is in such a poor state that it's more better for them to have the aggressive surgery, knowing that they're going to lose that weight. Whereas they might not want to have the adjustable band. Maybe they don't want to have the risk. So that is what I'm working on now: predicting the risk long-term out from short-term data. That's a real example. Fake example? Well. I just plotted the points and I see it's leveling off. Just like the surgery data, same thing, right? It's just it's just fake, that's all. It's the same thing. We call them toy plots where we understand things. So we understand here, I can plot the point and see. Where does it look like it might level off at? One, right? So we say the limit of that sequence is one. On the other one, we would say the limit of the sequence is 15% weight loss. One has meaning, one is fake. So I can answer that question. It should make clear sense. The real examples make it make it make sense, right? It's when it's fake, it starts to get like, right? what is that? N over n plus one. That's when they put scary math on the back of a, a movie on a board, right? Someone's really smart and they're a genius. They would stand in front of a blackboard and has scary math on it, has limits on it, with infinities and formulas. Um, I disagree with their answer a little bit. I, I, I am a mathematician. I, I just told you about the clothes thing, so you know that I, that wasn't a lie, actually. Um, but you know, I have to disagree with them. You can quibble a little bit. They say the terms approach and a as n becomes large means that that convergence. It could also. Um, what does it mean to say that this goes to infinity? See how it says if it goes to infinity, it says that it just becomes large. Well, something can become larger than it was previously and just level, but always become larger, right? So it also has to go without bound. It can't be bounded. It has to go up. So I would add this. That's the math side of me that gets a little anal about things. So that's the answer they want you to pick, though. They want you to pick that it just gets large as n gets large. Okay, you guys are starting.